Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Book Break for the Greece Public Library. I am Kirstra. I'm one of the librarians here. I moderate the Pines and Prose Book Discussion Group, as well as the Virtual Science Fiction and Fantasy Book Discussion Group. And as always, I am joined by my colleague, Claire. Hi, everyone. I'm Claire, and uh, I moderate the As the Page Turns and also the Historical Fiction Group yes. on Facebook. Yes. So welcome. Um, it has been a while since we have been with you. Um, so we are gonna do just sort of a general roundup today and talk about some of the books that we have been reading um, this early, late fall, early winter, um, right before Christmas. Christmas is just zooming right around the corner. Right, um, like a week away. I know. You're, you're baking, it's time to get on it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so if you need to some suggestions for books to stock up on for while you're home, I think we've got some good ones. Um, do you want to start, Claire, or do you want me to start? Sure, I'll start, and I'm, I'm going to go rogue on you. I'm going to do a, a dolly double, okay? What? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know me, I love all things dolly. So the first one I'm going to talk about is She Come By It Natural. And actually, this one is more like a book of essays um, done by Sarah Schmarsh, who wrote the book Heartland. It was a big award winner a couple of years ago. Um, and this one is interesting because, for one, Dolly was not interviewed for this book. It's more like how Dolly affected her and her family and how she perceives Dolly to be, um, although Dolly has never come out and said she's a feminist or, or breaking ceilings for women's rights, but she kind of attributes a lot of what she has done to um, how Dolly has affected women in general. Um, she and her grandmother that raised her went to a Dolly concert, um, bonded over that, and also just how the music affected her and the background of her life living in poverty um, so they very much related to how Dolly came from poverty, broke out, kind of, um, it was a series of essays that, I, I'm kind of wandering today, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a series of essays that she actually got a grant to write for a magazine. So hmm. that was probably, um, commentary on this, or the essays were written about four years ago. So she's had to do a little updating, and I found parts of it a little choppy. Um, but she did bring out how Dolly, uh, when there were the fires in the Smoky Mountains, mm -hmm. um, she's always given back to the land that she came from and that she loved, you know, the Imagination Library. So a lot of very positive things. Um, uh, it was a good read, but this one, this one is actually on Hoopla. So I was surprised. Uh. I, I'm pretty sure you ordered it, but you know, we're waiting for mm -hmm. our physical book, but I can't wait to get my hands on the physical book when it comes. It might, have, it might have just arrived. Like it might be up on the new shelf right now. I might've put it out yesterday, oh, I think. I may have to but. go grab that. <laughs> um, because this one, Dolly writes herself. She shares a mm -hmm. lot of her own photos and it's a story of how she wrote a lot of her, her songs, her famous songs. And the one thing I really loved about this is she said, if she's not known for anything else, she would love to be known for a songwriter because that was her original joy, um, not just in singing, but she felt like writing the songs allowed her to tell her story and so many feelings. Um, the one thing that I was completely blown away with, she, she writes like, and she has pictures of like what she's written songs on and it's everything from like a napkin or a paper towel to like uh, a hotel, you know, piece of stationery. Um, she shares a lot of family photos. It was just a joy um, to read. And um, she might've written Jolene and I will always love you on the same day, which to me is just completely and totally mind blowing. That, yeah. that two powerhouse, much covered songs um, would be written on the same day. And I can't remember one of these books mentioned that one she wrote, I will always love you. It was actually a goodbye to the, the show that she was on with, oh, now I can't think of his name, Parker, what's his name? 
um, the guy that kind of gave her a start. But hmm. um, people, uh, Elvis Presley wanted to record that song. Hmm. Um, but his manager at the time said, oh, anybody that, you know, Elvis would record their song, he's going to want half the royalties, you know, because he's Elvis. Mm -hmm. um, and Dolly, you know, at that time being a woman in that time period, stood her ground and said, no, um, I am keeping the rights to my songs. It's my song. You know, I'd be glad to let him uh, record it, but it's my song. And a lot of her family members, friends or whatever were like, are you crazy? You know, Elvis <laughs> wanted to record that song. And she was like, that song has paid my way, you know, many times over because it went on, like she recorded it twice. I believe mm -hmm. it went to number mm -hmm. one. And then of course, Whitney Houston mm -hmm. um, used it for the bodyguard. Yeah. And then yeah. it became a mega smash. And she said mm -hmm. the first time she heard that song on the radio with her singing. She just like stopped in her tracks. So, yeah. Um, and then they used it for like a country compilation uh, mm. done a few years ago, at, you know, where they kind of mishmashed a lot of top country artists. It might have been a fundraiser. And that was the end. And she comes in singing at the end. So, um, you know me. Love, love my dolly. And uh, recommend she's, both. She, yeah, she's awesome um, from her like her philanthropy, the more you learn about like the incredible amount of money and time that she's given back um, to the communities where she came up, like it's amazing. And I right. love, love, love reading about creative people and their process. Like when you find someone like that, like she, when you were talking about her writing songs on everything, like you know that there's just always like that creativity bubbling and they just have to do something. And I find that so fascinating. Right. Yeah. Even like the song nine to five that she wrote while mm -hmm. she was on that, you know, that was another one of those things, just jotting down bits at a time, you know, and, and now that song is pretty iconic as well, you know? Absolutely. Awesome. Very cool. Um, I don't have a book about Dolly Parton. Unfortunately. That's okay, because I did a double <laughs> double. So. There were, and there was even, I think, another one that came out this year. It was like the year of Dolly. Yeah, um, there was the Dollyisms one. I've read them all. So if yeah. anybody <laughs> Dolly, Dolly books, you, you just nice. write your comments on there. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, so I'm going to start, of my three books, I'm going to start with the one um, that I didn't love quite as much and get that out of the way. Um, so this one is The Year of the Orphan by, oh, the thing covers up, Daniel Findlay. Um, so I was actually really excited to pick this one up. I heard, um, or I read like a little summary about it, some buzz about it before it came out. Um, so this is a dystopia. Um, it's set in some kind of future world. Um, it's set in Australia. Um, so we don't know exactly what sort of apocalypse happened. Um, it could be climate change. It could be some sort of nuclear holocaust. We don't really know and it's not super important. Um, but it does take place in an Australia where um, water is very scarce and resources are very scarce. So there's um, very much kind of a Mad Max vibe to it. That I was That's like, exactly oh, yeah. what I was of. <laughs> Absolutely. And then the main character is a young girl who um, doesn't really have an actual name. She's referred to as the orphan through the entire book. Um, and she makes her living sort of scavenging the desert for um, relics of past civilization. So I was like, all of this, yes. Yes, yes, sign me up. Um, and it was a very interesting book. So I really liked um, the way that um, the author sets up what happens. And this is probably takes place a couple hundred years after our sort of current civilization has collapsed. Um, so there are sort of remnants of civilization like um, relics people have so there's a sort of a city except it's not quite a city so sort of a 
community in the desert um, that they call the system. Um, and it's got walls and there's people gathered there um, and living there and there's commerce and whatever. Um, but there is this huge trade in um, like screws and tools and like all of these little remnants of past society that they've sort of lost the ability to create, but they can still use them if they scavenge them. So I thought that bit was all very interesting. Um, the characters are interesting. Um, and they're, the author ties in pieces of Australian history um, that I wasn't, there were a few mentions that he made that I was like, that seems like something he wants the reader to know what it is. So I had to do some Googling <laughs> while I was reading. So there are, if you're familiar at all with Australian history, um, you may pick up a little more than I did um, off of first read. Um, but that was interesting too. Um, the thing that I didn't love about the book is that it's written sort of in dialect, I guess is the best word. Like it's kind of written in like a pidgin English um, where it's like folks who have never had any kind of formal education, no one they know has had any kind of formal education. They're still speaking English, but it is not, you know, proper English. Um, so it's not just the dialogue that's written that way, it's the whole book. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, so like some words are spelled differently and things, and it, it took me quite a while to sort of get used to that and be able to just read through the story without constantly trying to figure out what was being said. Um, so that, I didn't love that because it, it took me out of the story. I had to spend too much brain power trying to figure out what everyone was saying um, than actually paying attention to the story. And if you go on Goodreads, the reviews are split kind of 50-50. People who are like, I love this book, it was amazing. And people who are like, this book was cool and everything, but like the dialogue or the, the dialect really threw me. So that's one where it didn't work for me, but depending on your tolerance for that kind of thing, like it was still a very interesting story. I would have just rather um, it been written in a slightly different style, mm -hmm. I guess. So if you have read this book or you read this book, please tell me what you think. Let me know uh, how the, the dialect worked for you. So. All right. My second one is Tana French, The Searcher. Um, and you know, I, I know you love you some, some Tana French, you know, mm -hmm. and I love a good mystery. And um, this one really intrigued me because one, it's a standalone. It's not part of her Dublin murder series, mm -hmm. um, but it is about a policeman from Chicago who his, his marriage has broken up. Um, he's divorced. Uh, his, they have one child, a daughter, who the relationship is kind of struggling. He's having a lot of issues with that. Um, just the toll of the career and doing police work. He has decided that he wants a completely different change. So he moves to a small community in Ireland and buys a little croft and begins the project of restoration and the restoration is extensive because what we call an old house and people in Ireland that call an old house are two different very things. Different. Um, so at first it's, it, it, it's a very slow pace. I mean, um, I think Tana was going for the building of the pace mm -hmm. um, and you can have that pacing, but then it also can be kind of a slog at least for me, it was like, come on, Tana, let, let, let's move it, move it along, move it along. Um, so, of course, he's going to find, you know, a mystery there. You know, that's inevitable. So he begins to feel like he's being watched. And um, so he kind of sets himself up, you know, to see who this is. And it is a young boy um, who comes to him because he knows you know, even though he thinks he's incognito, everyone pretty much knows he's an ex-policeman from the States. Um, so she wants him to help find her brother who is missing. Um, 
And the thing is, is a lot of people in Ireland, a lot of the youth, you know, that live in these little small isolated communities, um, just get to the point where they bail and they, they have to go to the city. They don't want to keep farming on the little crofts, stay in poverty. They want a different life. So a lot of people in the community just attributed uh, the boy Brendan, who was the missing one, um, as just, you know, throwing in the towel and, and moving elsewhere. So, uh, you know, his sibling is just convinced that that wasn't the case. Um, there are certain things that he feels he would have taken um, that he wouldn't left without saying goodbye because even though the family is poverty stricken and everything, they, they were tight. Um, so Cal, the retired policeman, starts poking around. And as he starts poking around, people in the village start acting strangely. Um, and he gets warnings from people that were like normally friendly, you know, when he goes to the pub. So of course he digs in even further. Um, so there are a few things that come out. Um, I don't really want to give the ending away, but eventually you do find out what happened to Brendan. There are surprises with the sibling um, and uh, his relationship with the people definitely changes because of this investigation. And the only thing I wonder is, will he stay or will he go? And you don't really get that answer um, coming from this. So. Um, it is an interesting read. If you like Tana French, you'll probably like it. I'm not sure if it'll be your favorite Tana French ever, mm -hmm. but um, it was interesting and I, I did read it. The only thing I complain about is I thought the pace was a little slow. Um, when I had my Goodreads, you know, your books of 2020, it was my longest book of the year and I felt like she could have taken a good 50 to 100 pages mm -hmm. out of there. That just, you know, but it was a, a slow build and you you do want to find out what happens to them, so. Nice. Well, I'm, I'm definitely going to be reading that when I'm a, a ton of French completist. Um, and I, I think we had this conversation before, Claire, when you picked that one up, or maybe right after you finished it. Um, even within the, the Dublin Murder Squad books, um, there are definitely some that move faster than others. Mm -hmm. um, like, I think the likeness for me was really a slow pace and I was willing to to stick with it because I know she's she's going somewhere with it but right. there are definitely some that start to feel and the witch on too which is another standalone um and which is like a doorstep <laughs> of a book that one took a long time to get going so your mileage may vary yep same so um, so my next book is one that I really enjoyed, um, more than I even expected to. So it is, uh, Circe by oh, Madeline Miller. Been on my list for a while. It's been on sitting in my Goodreads to read list for years. <laughs> and I finally, um, got it on audio. Um, and it was a really good audio pick. Um, excellent narrator. So Circe is the retelling of um, the story of Circe from Greek mythology. So in the Odyssey, um, she is on an, she's the one on the island who turns Odysseus's men into pigs. Um, so she's like a witch on an island. Um, so of course in, and my Greek mythology is rusty, but as far as I recall, you don't get a whole lot more than that <laughs> from the Odyssey about Circe. So what Miller has done is taken this sort of little kind of side character and just given us her whole life. Um, and I, I love retellings. I really enjoy mythology. Um, so this was right up my alley. Um, and even though my mythology is rusty, um, you still, like, there were still folks that I recognized, like Odysseus factors in, um, Jason and Medea, um, Jason and the Argonauts and Medea, um, and a whole host of other folks. So Circe is the daughter of Helios, who is one of the Titans. Um, the Titans were sort of displaced by the Olympians, who, was, who were um, Zeus and his 
his group over there. Um, so she um, is the daughter of a Titan. She doesn't have, she thinks she doesn't have really any powers, but then she discovers this power of witchcraft essentially. So she can create spells, she can transform people and animals and objects. Um, and she is on her island because she has been banished from, um, from Helios's hall, palace, temple, wherever the, <laughs> wherever the Titans live, she's banished to this island. Um, and it's sort of about her really finding herself and, um, you know, deciding whether she wants to be a part of the world of the gods or a part of the world of men. Um, and it's, it's really interesting. So there is some, there are some like adventure parts to it and things, but it's really like a, almost like a coming of age, but it's, it's really a novel of her finding herself and figuring out who she really is and what she wants from life as opposed to what is expected of her. Um, oh. Yeah, so really, really good. Um, and I do recommend the audio, it was really well narrated. I hate when I want to read books that you've done because then it's like, you can't talk about it on book breaks. I know. <laughs> yes. So I'll definitely read that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. What's my one? Oh, my last one is one of my book in the, the month club. Mm -hmm. um, and this is one my daughter and I chose to read together because I've, you know, convinced her, one of my daughters to, to also do it. Um, it's called the Star Cross Sisters of Tuscany by Lori Nelson Spielman. And it has a little bit of romance in it, but not what you're thinking. Um, because I, I'm not a big romance reader. You know, I guess I'm just a, an old cogity, you know, bah humbug, you know. But this one was cool because um, it starts out in Italy and the family, um, the second born daughter is pretty much cursed. Um, she is not going to find true love ever, you know. So then you have like additional uh, how this curse is, is coming through layers of family. And then um, <laughs> Philomena Fontana cast a curse upon her sister more than 200 years ago for, for actually stealing her bow. Um, so there you have it. Um, so now we're in, in Brooklyn, New York, and um, the second born daughter is is uh working in a bakery totally ignored stomped on by her family um her nona is is just a beast you know she just shows her no love um she lives in a little tiny apartment her her best friend is a guy um he's obviously pining for her but um she is not really reciprocating it mm -hmm. you know she loves him as a best friend but just doesn't think that it's for her um doesn't really believe in the curse. Um, her cousin Lucy is pretty much running fast and loose, trying everything in her power to break the curse because her mother is throwing all kinds of, you know, dirt her way, saying that she'll never, she'll never do it, you know, and trying to have her throw down the gauntlet. Well, anyway, their Aunt Poppy invites both of them to go on a trip to Italy where she is convinced that she will meet the, the love of her life at age 80 on the steps of this cathedral, you know, that she promised years ago. Um, so even though they both think it's crazy and Nona has put the big kibosh on it, um, gosh, I can't think of the main character's name. This is <laughs> they all have these, Amelia? Um, no. So anyway, they decide to go. She, she decides the heck with it. I've never had an adventure. I'm stuck in this bakery. You know, I don't even care about the curse. I just want to go to Italy. So they all go. And of course there are family secrets to be discovered. Um, there is love, but not, not the way you think. Um, hmm. And it all does kind of work out nicely. It's a great, perfect light read. If you want something fun, um, you want like a little travel adventure and finding mm -hmm. out about it's more about the family secrets, um, not so much about the curse. And uh, it, was, it was very good, kept me entertained. Nice. I enjoyed it. 
Very cool. I did a make note today, so I am like all over the place. <laughs> um, did it make you want to eat all of the Italian food? Everything always makes me want to eat. Nice. And especially um, the bakery, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's go make some Italian cookies. Yeah, them all. that's good. Yeah. Um, so my last book is also something sort of light and fun. It is, um, wow, No Thank You by Samantha Irby. Um, this is Samantha Irby's second book of essays. Um, her first one, I have not read, um, but I'm going to have to go back and read it now. Um, this is another one I actually listened to on audio. It is read by the author and I was listening to it at work and like, laughing out loud to myself while I was listening to it, which is always great. And then your coworkers yeah. think that you're insane. Um, <laughs> but it is so, I found this book so funny. Um, the author is almost exactly my age. Um, so even though she had a different sort of growing up experience than I did, she has a lot of the same sort of cultural touchstones. Um, so that was fun for me. Um, but so Samantha Irby is um, a writer. She grew up in Chicago um, and now lives uh, in sort of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, I think. Um, but it's so the first essay in the book is about how um, the author loves to read like celebrity beauty routines. Like, you know how magazines will always do that. Like, here is the the obvious lie version of like how I get where I am, right? And she's like, and I just like, I love it. I love reading all of it. I feel like I'm gonna discover like the secret to like being a better person, right? And then she's like, but it's all like, none of it's true. And here is what my personal <laughs> beauty routine would look like. And it's like the actual, um, like true story of what someone my age with like no time <laughs> and, and, you know, would actually get up to. Like I go into the bathroom and I look at all of the pots of like all of the expensive creams that I have. And I, you know, anyway, I, I'm not going to do it justice because repeating someone else's funniness is never <laughs> as funny. Um, but it is really, really funny. Um, she at one point goes out to LA. She was one of the writers on Shrill, um, which was the series on Hulu based on Lindy West's memoir um, or book of essays. So she talks about that and like having a, a real person job in an office with catered lunches after working as like a vet receptionist for most of her adult life while she writes on the side. So it's, it's very, very funny. Um, it is uh, profane. So if that's not your jam, beware. <laughs> um, but I really enjoyed this book. It goes so fast. Um, so if you just need something sort of light and funny to get you through these dark winter nights, highly recommend Wow No Thank You by Samantha Irby. Nice. So yeah. So hopefully some some good ones there for folks to pick up and maybe read by the fire during the holidays. Um, and we will be back in two weeks. So New Year's Eve Eve. And we're going to be rounding up our best and or favorite books of 2020. So get ready. Yeah, Claire's ready, ready to go. Good picks. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> celebrating the best reads of 2020. Absolutely. So I'm super excited about that. Um, and I hope you all come prepared with your best of 2020 um, and see, you know, what sort of overlap we've got. Because I think, Claire, that your list and my list are probably going to be very different. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think we like a lot of the same things, mm -hmm. but now do this. <laughs> Although I have read a couple of yours. Like, I remember yeah. the going to ground and a few mm -hmm. others. But yeah. Yeah. So cool. All right. Well, happy holidays, everyone. Um, I hope you have a very festive 
and safe next couple of weeks. And we will be back on December 30th to talk to you about our best books of 2020. Yes. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you soon. Keep reading. Excellent.